Hello, Vol Nation. Welcome to another episode of Believe in Tennessee Football. I'm your host, as always, Kyler Kerbison, joined with Reed Bacon. We're breaking down the tough loss to Purdue. Uh, we're talking offense, defense, everything that went into some of the play calls that we saw, uh, some of the performances that happened out there, and we both go on our rants about the officiating and how this needs to be fixed and just how much Tennessee has been screwed over uh, these past, say, 15 years. So fun podcast, give you guys some insight. Uh, let's jump into it. The game. Snap, the kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no sir Ree. No sir Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. Looks, loads up. Fires long for the end zone. The pass is going to be caught by Tennessee. Tennessee wins! by Tennessee to one Jennings. Jennings makes the catch in the end zone on the Hail Mary. Well down at the 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. What did he do? All he did was score. Joey Pitt. Touchdown on play number one. Okay, so before we jump into the podcast, got to shout out our number one sponsor, betonline.ag. You got to go there to bet on any games. Listen, football, full swing. We're getting into bowl games. We're getting into college football playoffs. It's getting a later half of the NFL, you know, maybe some playoffs coming up. Basketball's in full swing. NBA, college basketball, now just starting up. To make all those games more exciting, you got to bet on them. Put some money down. It really gets the adrenaline going. So for stats, for odds, for spreads, everything that you need, betonline.ag is the place to go. Uh, Right now, they've just updated their um, desktop version of their website. So it looks brand new. So go there or on your mobile device. And when you sign up, you'll receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. If you use code BELIEVE50, that's B L E A V. Five zero. So make sure and use that when you when you first sign up and you receive that fifty percent welcome bonus, which is just hey, it's extra money. Why wouldn't you do it? Um, so head on over to uh, betonline.ag. It's it's the best place to do any bets. Um, it's just the best sports book out there. So go on over. All right, welcome in everyone. Um, I'm a little bit more calm and in better spirits now that it's been a few days since the game. Uh, but it sure as heck stings. I will tell you this Titans being in top of the division definitely helps with that pain. Uh, Reed, what say you? How you doing, bud? Let's go get turned up. Guys. <laughs> Listen, uh, man, it's been a, it's been a great uh, New Year's, great weekend. So I'm back up here, as you guys can see, in the hotel room in uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire, up here visiting my wonderful, most beautiful girlfriend, Ariel. So, no, it's been great. You got to come up here and see her, um, hang out, exchange gifts. Check out – dude, look how sexy I look in this gift she got me. It's a picture – can you see that? <laughs> yeah. It's a picture from uh, my cousin's Lee and Liz's double wedding, and it was a picture of us, and then it got, like, wooden engraved off that, you know, Etsy website. It's pretty sick, but then she got me, uh, check this bad boy out. I wasn't going to be wearing it today, but I was running behind. I'll wear it next week. Okay. You know, hey, you, maybe. You, you can just maybe, run on the field. I'm, you look like a coach now. Wait, well, hey, hey, that's what I was about to say. I said I should have put this thing on Thursday and gotten out there and helping the daggum DBs. You know, so um, hold on, let me put this up. So, anyways, I love that. And uh, then she got me some Lulu pants. No, it's been great being up here, Titans, the number one seed. Let's go, baby. I'm <laughs> juiced. This is why, I mean, I just love Braves. I love the team. I mean, granted, there's another week to go. Hopefully, we take care of business and the Chiefs, whatever. But if we get that game coming through Nashville, I mean, I got to I got to put like 10K aside because the boy's going to the Super Bowl if we go. So, 
which stinks. Right. It's, which stinks. It's in LA. But we'll cross that bridge when time comes. But um, and you know what? I was pissed about the Purdue game, but like, it, it's a bowl game. Like, yes, it matters. But I think people watching. I was, wa- I was wondering what you you were gonna say because last week you were like, it's so important to win this. We got to have momentum moving forward and everything like that. And now that we lost it, it's kind of like, yeah, it does suck. But it's also – it also, like, pissed everybody off. Like, you could tell all the players and coaches were like, all right, get ready for next year. So, the reason it was important to win, and I do think that we could have played better, um, and I think we had a lot of missed opportunities, and we'll dive into that here shortly. For me, though, I think – so many people were watching that game nationally that that you're not coming away from that like oh my gosh Tennessee's garbage or Tennessee just got whipped on national stage or they got a lot of stuff they need to work on like no people saw us get robbed so fortunately it's the best way to lose because yeah we lost and yeah we don't have a bowl, another bowl win or whatever and I hate it for some of those guys they don't get to say they won the bowl but like people know we got job so Purdue can't be like, yeah, Purdue, Purdue can't be like, yeah, we won. Like, no, you didn't. Like, UT got screwed. It's more about UT getting screwed than it is Purdue winning. But, yeah. I mean, I just feel bad for the players and that they don't get to celebrate the win. But, I mean, it's a Music City Bowl. I mean, it's it's not a big deal. We didn't, yeah, we didn't, get, exactly. we didn't get blown out or outplayed. Yeah, I mean, when we were in the Music City Bowl 2016, it was like, God, why are we even here? You know, and now it's like, well, we're in a bowl. So that's good. Um, so it's all about perspective, but yeah, I agree with you. I think no, like no one came out of this week and was like, Hey, you know what? Purdue's a really good team and they're going to be a good team in the future. And like, they have a lot of stuff going. They, the whole talk was like, Tennessee got screwed. Tennessee should have won that game. Purdue should not have won that. And I, I can only imagine how that feels as a Purdue fan, as a Purdue player, where everyone's like, you didn't actually win that game. <laughs> like, I, You know, I don't think they actually care. I mean, because if we won a game and someone's like, oh, you didn't deserve it. Like, say, like, for example, like, if we went on a Hail Mary, like when we did against Georgia, and Georgia's like, you guys got lucky you had a Hail Mary, I'm going to be like, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. We still won. We still won. You know, like a little kid. You know, like, if I'm a, if we won that exact way, same way to Purdue, and say I'm flying home tomorrow back to Knoxville and I run into a Purdue fan and – Chicago when I'm flying, you know, make a connecting flight and I have my UT stuff on. By the way, I'll be wearing Titans. But if I see somebody and they're wearing Purdue stuff and they see me wearing Tennessee and they're like, oh, you guys got lucky to win, I, I, most likely I'd be friendly and be like, yeah, it was a good game. We got fortunate. But if it was someone that, like, pissed me off, I'd be like, yeah, we still won. Like, see a loser. So yeah. I, don't think they, I don't think they care. Yeah, but also it's not just us saying – how we got screwed it is everyone i mean every espn analyst every fox analyst like everybody who covers college football barstool sports was saying i mean everyone was like holy crap tennessee just got screwed over and it was almost like a thank god you guys see it how many times we've been screwed over in the past and like everyone thinks it's oh just tennessee fans being you know ridiculous and and you know you know how crazy they are. They throw mustard bottles on the field and they get uh, coaches fired before they ever even sign. It's like, <laughs> we're crazy for a reason, people. Like, you, like there's there's a reason that, that our minds are messed up the way that they are. It's because of all the crap that we've been through. All and it's just like finally like someone else on the outside can see it and see, all like, this is why we are as crazy as we are. All the abuse and uh, post-traumatic stress. But you know what, though? I do, th- I do think, like, if we were other fans of other teams, like, I'm assuming we would still have, like, you know, if we're like a, a Florida fan. We're like, oh, remember that one time against Arkansas when we got screwed on this call? It's like, I'm assuming there's other things that we forget about. Like, Tennessee's not the only team that gets screwed. Everybody thinks their teams get screwed. But it does seem like Tennessee has some pretty pretty wild wild things. So. Wild. And, I mean, it's it's – Happened multiple times this year. It's happened multiple times in the past. I mean, just like, just ridiculous stuff that is heartbreaking. Like, I would say, like, us losing to Florida on that Hail Mary is more heartbreaking than Georgia losing to us on our Hail Mary. 
that like, I, I, you know, us losing to Georgia when Pig Howard fumbled out of the back of the end zone. I, like, I would say that's worse than, you know, Alabama losing to Texas a and on a field goal this year. Like it, like, it's a lot worse. Like when we lose, it is in the craziest fashion ever. That 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 last one was a better example. That last one was a better example because uh, I know what you mean. Like the two hell marys are two hell marys. Like, I mean, Georgia had people down there, and Juwan just went up and made a play. The one against Florida, we're like in a cover due, and Micah Abernathy just gets run by. It's just like, like what what's going on here? Like what are we doing? <laughs> so I mean, but the the second one, you're right. Just losing on a last second field goal when pretty much Texas a and dominates that game compared to Pig Howard, poor guy, like stretching his whole body out and then fumbles out of the back of the end zone for a touchback. <laughs> it's crazy. the worst thing ever, dude. It's crazy. It, I think it's worse when it's like it, it it has nothing to do with the skill of like a certain player on one side or the other. Like when Jawan Jennings goes up and catches the ball over seven Georgia defenders, it's like, holy crap, he made a play. Like, Georgia can't be like, we got screwed to be like, this guy just mossed everyone. But, like, when Abernathy's just not even close to the Florida guy and you're like, what What are you doing? Like, what is happening right now? Like, it wasn't right. like Florida dude went up and made a huge catch or, like, mossed him or what. He was just open. He just ran or, straight. Or same thing with, yeah, same thing with BYU a couple of years ago. And it's like, all right, deepest the deepest. And then, like, Elante Taylor, just, like, whatever, he's, like, got, he, his eyes get caught in the backfield, and it's just like, hey, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, jump into it, though. I'm, I'm ready to hear this. I want to hear what, what your thoughts are about, you know, the whole game. Yeah, so um, I, 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 I kind of have it, like, split up offense, defense, and then just refs as, uh, as a category all, all its own. So I'm going to start with the refs, and then I'll – we can break down the game a little bit more. There were calls out there that I did see that obviously was a pass interference, obviously was a holding, obviously was an offsides, obviously illegal formation. Like there were penalties like that, but there were also penalties where a ref is just guessing that it is a pass interference or is just guessing that it is a holding. Like on one of Valus Jones's returns, they call holding. It was the ref on the, opposite side of the field looking from behind the the Purdue player so he couldn't even see where our guy's hands were and he threw a flag because the Purdue's guy's arms went up in the air he's like oh that obviously must be a holding that it's just guessing there was the same thing on a pass interference where our back is to him he can't see that we're grabbing a hold on, on a slant our uh, uh, Theo Jackson's back was to the uh, ref but the ref behind him threw the flag. He can't see that he's holding on to him. He's just reacting off of the Purdue player. That is guessing. That was was that the uh, that was like earlier in the game, like the third and five or whatever. In the yeah, video. yeah, something like that. But it was on Theo, and it, it's just like that is guessing. That's just guessing that it is a flag that you didn't actually see it. You're just like, oh well, that Purdue player looks like he got held. You can't. You cannot call. You cannot call penalties based off that. You also can't just call penalties because a DB is touching a wide receiver on a throw. Like I think two of the Warren Burrell pass interferences were BS where both of them had a hold of each other and the ball just kind of fell between them. Like you, you can't just call it because it's like, Oh, well, I guess he's right there. Like you have to take in into play. Like what is the offensive player doing? Like, is it back and forth? Like wh what I just feel like, they just assume that in this situation, that's what it usually would be. And then they threw the flag for it. That's almost what it seemed like. And then the piece de la resistance. I mean, it makes it. How bad they are, how many penalties they call. And no one, no one's going to believe you. They're going to think that you're, you know, an idiotic fan who just cares too much. And it doesn't, doesn't really know football or care or like, doesn't really understand the game and, and, and thinks that you're just complaining. But then they do what they do best and absolutely destroy a call to end the game that would have, I believe, won us the game because Purdue is very bad in the red zone. And it just validates everything everyone was saying the entire game. It validates all of it. And I just don't understand how the opinion of one man 
on a play can end a game. The opinion of one ref, not every ref, not a conglomerate, not looking at the replay and everyone talks together and we watch it over and over again. And then we make a decision. It is one guy saying, I think it's down. I think it's stopped right now. And that is it. They're saying that you can't replay it. They're saying you can't watch it over again. They're saying you can't, you can't go back on it. It is just all dependent on one guy saying, I think this is what happened. I think this is what happened. Not I know, I think. That is insane to me. There has to be a rule change. There has to be something. I looked it up and I'm going to put it on YouTube. I'm going to put it on our video. But that night I was so pissed. I looked up the rule books for college football and it says an in instant replay you can review forward progress on a first down or on a goal line yet they literally said this is just for looks we just said that we're reviewing it for looks because we can't do anything about it the fact that you cannot do anything like you're saying you cannot do anything about it is ridiculous you can't even look at the last play of a game you can't even look at it there's like you're literally just going off what one person said, and that's how you end one of the best games in the entire United States. Like, that's how you end the game. Like, that's how you can end the game. That, like, it has to be better, and, and these refs had, have to be held accountable. Like, horrible, horrible, horrible officiating gets you a two-game suspicion, apparently. These guys apparently did the Miami and Duke game where Miami threw four, 14 laterals and scored a touchdown <laughs> trick return, and they got suspended two games. Two games. That's it. They kept their job. They got suspended two games, and that was in the middle of the season. So guess what? They finished the season. They kept their job. They kept getting paid. Nothing happened. No one even knows their name. That's the worst part about rest. A lot of people have no idea who these guys are. They're blank faces. No one knows them. So if they mess up, who cares? You don't even notice a guy walking down the street in your grocery store. While in the meantime, when you watch them on Saturdays, you want to punch them in the face. It's just that's it, why that, that's why they do that. They can't say their names because then someone is going to punch them in the face in the middle of Publix, you know, at, at the Publix uh, meat section. Like, yeah. Well, guess what? If if the NCAA held them accountable, then no one else would want to punch them in the face. I'm telling you right now, if NCAA came in and go, hey, you guys did a horrible job and you didn't call the right calls and you're calling bull crap and you should have done something different on that last play, I'm taking pay. Wait, you're not getting paid for that game. Perfect. No one else is going to threaten the guy or want to try and kill him or anything like that because I know that happens. He got punished. You, you do something bad, you get punished for it. That's how things work. That's how you're grow that's how you grown up. That's how you get taught lessons. Thing. You cannot do bad things because bad things will happen to you. And that's what this ref did. It's a bad, very, very bad thing. You naughty boy, you. <laughs> <laughs> naughty boy. Um, All right. I think I'm okay. done. You, I, you, can, you can go now. I, I kind of got it off my chest. Okay. I, listen, I totally understand where you're coming from. And I totally get why so many people were mad. Um, I, I was pissed, but I wasn't like, well, let me say that. I probably wasn't even pissed. I was like frustrated, but I kind of just smiled and laughed. I was like, dude, this is so typical. Um, I would have been more frustrated if Tennessee had not covered because I had teased Tennessee. So if we had lost the game and I lost my bet, yeah, then I would have been furious. But this, like, I would have been really upset if this had been like an SEC game or like, you know, obviously like an SEC championship. It's a Music City Bowl. Like, do I want to win? Yes. But like, at some point, I just – I can't keep getting outraged over absolute nonsense. Now, here's the deal. I love the fact that there is starting to get some steam and momentum building for refs to be full-time refs. You know, they're not accountants or business owners or operations managers or attorneys or whatever. And then they're – like, people are saying, hey, we need to have full-time refs. And I'm fine with that. And then there's also that the more steam and more momentum that, hey, they need to be held accountable or that they need to answer questions from the media. I'm fine with all of that. But my thing is, is no matter how many things that you do to try to prevent human error, we can all do the absolute best we can, but none of us are perfect. So there are, there is going to be errors. So my biggest thing 
to where a game doesn't end on human error has to be the someone in a booth or someone in a control center and just says, hey, it was wrong on the field. It's okay. It was a touchdown. The four, you know, the momentum wasn't stopped. It shouldn't have been stopped. Like, and the whistle did see, it would have been a lot tougher to argue what I'm arguing if there had been a whistle, but the whistle was after the fact. And so I do like that the NFL, I feel like, has done much better this year and years past, or like the past couple of years, where they're like, hey, let the play happen. Just let the play happen. You know, a lot of those with the quarterback's arms coming through and it gets hit, just let it happen. Let let the big fat boy defense lineman pick it up and run it and score it, and we'll check and see if it's a touchdown or not. And that's what should have happened here. I get it. You can't just allow a game going on. I mean, a play to go on for 10 seconds because you got a running back stalemated with a, a safety and then all of the big heavies push in and like, okay, we get it. But on a situation like that, he's still fighting and he's not down. So that's why the – Forward momentum and forward progress is more about when two guys are kind of doing this nonsense. But they weren't doing that anymore. Like, he was just been on the ground. Technically, like, he could still reach the ball over or shimmy his way over because he's not down. You know what I mean? And so yeah. it wasn't your typical uh, forward progression play. So, for me, mistakes are going to happen, and I'm fine with that referee making a mistake. But you have to be better, and what I want to be better – is there's a control center and say, hey, the player was not down. He reached the ball over. It's a touchdown. And yeah. and it should be as simple as that. We have technology that can see those things. And that's where the that's that's where these referee issues should be done with. And like I said, if you want to make these guys answer questions, if you want to take their pay away, if you want to make them be full time referees, and not, I mean, I don't care. You can do all that. I just want to get it corrected on the field and then we don't have to worry about anything else. So, you know, for me, that last play, like, I, it does make me feel a little bit better that it was 100%, like, you know, in the college football world, it was world-renowned, Tennessee got jobbed. Everyone said it, you know. And so, like, that makes me feel better. Um, the stuff about the P.I., bro, I really struggle with this because it's like there were a lot of those that are just 50-50. If, if the receiver's allowed to have his hands on me, I should be able to have his hand, my hands on him. And we're just joshing, we're fighting for it jostling fighting for it looking up trying to find the ball but after they do it and call you a couple of times for it and i i saw a couple of times they called uh warren burrell for it and then there was one time they didn't and he looked around earlier in the game and he looked around there was no flag but at halftime how does hypel which he might have or how does william martinez or tim banks not go to a ref and just like hey like what, what are we doing here like go to the ref and say hey you know, like, are you letting him play? Can My guy's got his hands on him. His guy's got hit. Like, what are we doing? And I started thinking yesterday and today, all the times I played defensive back and all the times I was coached and all the times I've been around it, it was always that you turn your back and find them with a hand or find them with a hand and you kind of press them. You know, whatever you're doing at the line of scrimmage, whether you jam or you're playing off, as soon as they, like, break your – cushion type deal if they come in okay you're jumping in behind it but if they break out or they're going straight you open up your hips and turn and run with them and then use your backhand to find them and not aggressively but subtly you kind of box them out to the to and you use the sideline as your defender so that's what i'm thinking so if i'm playing corner perfectly and i got a guy to go route i maybe hit him with my hands i open up i feel him I look straight, we're both running, and then you can kind of watch their eyes, and if they see the eyes coming, then you turn and look. Or you might just go ahead and turn and look because you feel like you have them in good position. I don't know what happened to that because every day or every time I saw them yesterday playing man coverage, they were turning towards the player. So that's obviously something that's taught. And listen, I'm not saying that you can't play it that way, but that opens up to more hand calls. You see what I'm saying? And so, like, that's what bothered me. And so it's kind of like, Half of it is on Warren Burrell. Like, if they're going to call you for that, man, like, you got to just keep your hands off of him. Like, I know it's tough, but, like, keep your hands off of him. Maybe try to open up the other way and get your eyes on the ball. You know, that one towards the end of the game where it was, like, third and five, we stopped him, we stopped him, and then they just bombed it deep. And Warren looked like he just fell down and kind of stopped because he didn't know what else to do. And they catch it and house call it. And – that stuff was just really tough, but I just feel like it's 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 Warren's got to be better. Our coaches have to like talk to the rest of them, like, hey, what are you guys allowing him to do? 
And then obviously the refs have to be better. Like you got to call it fair and square for the DB and the receiver. So that stuff just really, really irritated me. Um, I agree with the Warren Rell thing. Like I think he has to be better too. I mean, he got beat by a dude that's had 200 yards receiving the entire year and he's got two bum knees. Like yeah. not just the penalties, like he got beat by him a couple times where yeah. – you know, man coverage, he he beat him deep. Man coverage, he beat him on a slant. Man coverage, he jumps over him like he did in that last one. But what's really weird and, like, how Warren can't necessarily get a feel for it is, like, the two big PIs he had and then that play that you're talking about were the last two drives of the game. So right. before that, he had one penalty. He's like, okay, it's just one penalty. Like, I'm, I'm playing the way I play. They're not saying anything to me. They're not doing anything about it. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, you're you're not good. Like, you're doing it completely wrong, which is, like, where do you have that time to adjust, right? Like, if I'm a, if I'm a coach, like, I'm not even really thinking about Warren doing that. He hasn't shown any, any of that earlier in the year. He isn't, like, a penalty problem guy. And he only has one penalty in the first half. I'm not. I'm more worried about like how we let them score towards the end, how our second quarter wasn't as productive as it should have been like that kind of stuff. It, it, it like didn't even get on the radar. And then all of a sudden it's just like all of these different things start hitting at the very end of the game. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like what the hell's going on? Like where, where the hell have you guys been? Why are you all of a sudden throwing all these flags? And this hasn't even been an issue before. That's where it like that's, almost blindsides you as a player and a coach. That's fair. You're no, you're 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 right about that. That's fair. And that's a good point. And um, yeah, because if it is happening late in the game, they don't have time to go and maybe ask. If it happened three or four times early in the game, you're right. So maybe as a as a defensive backs coach or like a GA, you hope that they're seeing something that maybe having a conversation with Warren. But no, you're right. I mean, it happens later in the game. But um, but he, you know, he he has to be better once he gets called on that one time. Maybe he goes over to the ref and be like, ref, if we're both got hands on each other, like what, what am I supposed to do? And just see what the ref says. And then you got to be a good enough player to adjust to that. Yeah. Cause so. I mean, the, the second one, the Tennessee sideline thought it was an offensive pass interference. Like they immediately yeah. were like, he just pushed him down. Right. And the ref was like, Oh no, it's on him. Like, <laughs> Just it, like they didn't even think it was close to being on Warren. They were like, oh, perfect. We got we got redemption from the last one because he literally just had his hands on him and pushed him like this is going to be perfect right. for us. And it didn't didn't go our way. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I guess well, we can. Me, I want to I want to hear what you go ahead. What you want to start offensive defense? Because I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Well, we were just talking about Warren. So I feel like we should stay defensive side. Let's do it. Um. Another, like you, you had mentioned earlier, the DBs is really uh, what you want to talk about here. And and one thing I noticed is Deshaun Rucker, number twenty eight. I this is like really the first time I really saw him out there. I, I, like when he first got beat, I was like, "Is that Theo?" Like, no way that like Theo got beat like that because twenty six and twenty eight are so close. And I'm right. like, who who is this guy? Freshman that we have to put out there that really hasn't played much at all. If he has this year, I haven't even seen him and we're putting him in man coverage versus like they're, I guess, you know, number one guys right now, cause bell is gone, but dude, like he's a freshman in his first start. Like I, I just don't agree with, I don't agree with doing that as a co on the coaching side. Like, I understand you got to throw your guys in the fire sometimes and like, Hey, this is going to make you a better player. And like, you, you know, are you, do you have that competitive drive? Like, are you going to be able to do, but like, if they're not skilled enough yet, like you have to understand your weakness. Like he's your weakness. Purdue knows he's your weakness. As soon as they saw him out there, like, heck yeah, we got a freshman DB who hasn't played a lot and we got man one-on-one -on -one coverage. I'm throwing this ball no matter what. And it, I mean, he was getting killed. So if I'm Tim Banks, I'm thinking they're going to attack him. They're going to. I got to I got to give him some kind of safety help. I can't leave him on an island by himself. So I was just a little annoyed by that. I thought like in a scenario like that, like if you're put in that scenario where you have a guy who's not your starter, who's not the the best person that you could have out there, he hasn't played all year because he's not that good and you put him out there and put him one on one. 
versus a very pass heavy team. That's just a really tough look to me. Like in my, in my point of view, like I would think of it as the same way of being like, Hey, we're going to run, run six man protection. And I just put in this freshman left tackle and he's never played before only in like fourth quarter we're blown out teams and I'm putting him in at left tackle and he's going against their starting defensive end. And I'm not giving him any help. He's on an Island by himself. I have slide going away from him. He has no running back chip. That's how I view it. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Like that is the last, like you should always give him help. I mean, offensive coordinators are just around Aaron Donald or, or, or Watt, both Watt brothers or, you know, Miles Garrett, like they, they figure out, you know, okay, where's our strength? Where's our weakness and try and protect their weakness and, and let their strength show. So I, that's where I was like, this is not good. Like he should not be in man coverage. If he's out there, if he's out there to get someone a break, make it zone. Don't, don't put him in man one-on-one -on -one coverage. Cause I'm sure, you know, you don't want Burrell and you don't want uh, any of the other corners just playing the entire game. Cause that's pretty much what was happening with Burrell and Hayden. So it, it hurt us not having Kenneth George. Obviously, everyone knew uh, Alante Taylor was uh, resting up and getting ready for the draft. Okay. I'm not sure what happened with Kenneth George, uh, what injury or whatever it was. Um, I like Kamal Haddon. I like him a lot, actually. And I and I, I was fine with Warren Burrell. I mean, everybody's allowed to have a bad game. He had a pretty rough one. But with Rucker, like – the one where he got mossed down on the goal line and then they, we ended up holding him to a field goal. He was in good position and the guy just made a really good catch. So I'm not going to fault him on that one. Like it happens. The other one that you're talking about where it was early in the game and they, right when we scored, they come back and bomb it. I really like the play design and I watched all four of the defensive backs. So if you're watching on, if you're watching on YouTube, obviously they're rolling right. I'll put the Rutgers players back let, back side, okay? And it's, it's, it's one of these plays that a lot of people run where they roll it out and throw it back, and there's multiple ways to do it at multiple distances or, or links. You know, sometimes it's a throwback that's 10, 15 yards, and sometimes it's a shot play like this one. So I was watching, well, his, core, his safety on his side was Trayvon Flowers. Well, at first it did look like it was man because Trayvon is watching, he's still hit at his 12 to 15 yards deep over the tight end. And his eyes are on the tight end because I'm watching it because we got lucky and they showed an aerial view of the shot play. So I watched it a bunch. Well, then the back side safety is, is Tate McCullough. And then on the other side, you had, um, I think it was Kamal Hayden maybe was on the other side. I so think. it looked like it could have been man. And then we don't know. It could have been. It could have been cover four, and 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 Tank has his eyes in the wrong or, or, or Trey Flowers has his eyes in the wrong spot because when that tight end comes up, Trey watches him and backside safety, meaning backside of the tight end, he's watching him too on a dig. So it's like, why are both of our safeties watching that? So it's like, was it man? Was it quarters? Was Tank McCullough supposed to be? You know, could have been three where you had. Um, Rucker deep, Kamal Hayden deep. Um, Trey was the was the you know robber flat area three, and then Tank was supposed to be deep, and that was where he was supposed to have help. So I don't know what the coverage was, and and so I don't want to kill him. If it was man, listen, like it's tough to play man. My biggest thing is like if you can't make the play, just try to make the tackle, which that is one of the most difficult tackles to make when you don't have an angle and he's running and you're running, and then all he has to do is put the brakes on like you got to be better I just wish I knew what the coverage was because if he is playing outside why was there not safety help why did both the safeties come up so maybe it was man coverage and he just got toasted so I get it for you what you're saying about give the guy some help like you know what your weak spot is like give him some help and I get that I think it's way different when it is an offensive lineman. Uh, when I, when if it's offensive lineman, I'm like, yo, you got to give this guy tight end help or chip or slide protection, whatever. When it's a DB, if they don't have some dog receiver and you're not guarding, hey, we have to stop him and double team him, then it's kind of it's kind of tough to give, you know, 
second help on a guy who's just an average receiver. So I know you're not really saying that, but that's kind of where I got it. So it's like maybe, okay, just leave a guy deep. Like always have a third, like a, a, a player deep. Always have one of your safeties playing deep. Don't let them come up. Don't let them play man, like whatever. So I, I get what you're saying. I think it's a little bit harder to, to do and like don't double the guy that Rutgers guarding, but just maybe have a safety deep. Um, yeah. Because I, I, my thought process is you don't have to double the guy that Rutgers guarding. Just have some safety help that's the safety deep while he is in the game, while Rucker is in the game. He didn't play. He played 10% of the defensive snaps. Most of it was Burrell and was Hayden. Like that was our two corners, 90% of the game. So while he's in there, knowing that he is a freshman and is – not as good as your third and fourth string corners. <laughs> you know, he's at least your fifth to sixth string corner that, hey, I'm going to give him help while I have him in there. I'm not going to leave him on an island by himself. That's all I, That's all I'm saying. Not saying you got to okay. do it all game. Not saying you got to do it because that wide receiver. I'm just saying for him and the 10% of the snaps he's in there, give the guy a little help. He's not ready. Like, he just isn't. Yeah. That's why he's your sixth option. That's why right. he going. That's why if Alante plays and George plays going into this game, he's your sixth best corner, right? Like, no, it, I, yeah. Now it's just forced upon you, but like you should know that. I feel you, and I agree with you. I just don't want to crush the kid because I don't know what the play call was on the one deep shot, and the other one he got moss. Like it, it happens. He was in good coverage, so yeah. But I, I agree. I agree. If he's only in eight to twelve to fourteen percent of the plays. Just get someone deep with them, you, you know, just have, you know, so I, I, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, our safeties, I had someone hit me up uh, on, on Twitter asking about our safeties and asking about the defense as a whole. Honestly, man, our safeties are just kind of who they are. It's kind of what they've been. Um, there's plays where I'm just like, what, you know, WTF, like, what are you doing? Um, I thought Trey Flowers had one of his best – bigger hits of the game, the dislodge of ball. He had the great pick where he was in play. I mean, it was just an overthrow, but, hey, he was in position. He made the pick. It was a crucial time of the game. Um, they just – I think they're just um, – they're just who they are. I think they're very – I mean, I hate I hate saying this because I don't feel like I'm beating up on them. Like, hell, they're a thousand million times better than I ever was or whatever. But they're just kind of – they're just kind of average. They're just fine. You know what I mean? Like, no disrespect to them, but, like, Trey made some plays when he needed to. I remember when Tank McCullough first came in the game a long time ago when he was a true freshman. And I swear to you, one of the first plays he was in the game, I saw him shoot up and just fire out of a cannon and come up and make a nice hit, nice tackle. I'm like, who the hell's 22? I'm like, what's this guy? And I look him up. It says freshman, Tank McCullough. I'm like, dude, this guy kind of looks rocked up. Like, dude, this guy could be a nice little enforcer for us for a couple of years. And then he's just never really panned out like I like I thought he would would be. And, um, you know, like, I just I, you know, I just think they are who they are. And, uh, you know, whether it's some bad angles sometimes and just maybe it's just kind of in, some, some inconsistencies where it's like don't make a good play here and there. And then other times, like I said, you know, they, you know, you, you'll scratch your head. Um, now, Kamal Hatt Hatton, I always have a problem. I want to say Hayden, but Kamal Hatton, I love the way that guy's played. Like, when we saw him at practice, fiery competitor. We said it on that podcast. We said, this guy's fiery. We like him. We like Brandon Turnage, which we didn't even mention Brandon Turnage. So, hell, Rucker could have been like seventh. Yeah. You know, you know so Brandon Turnage didn't play. I like both those guys a lot. But I love how Kamal is the most prototypical corner you're ever going to see. He is that guy that can literally get a P.I. or get burnt, and the next play, that boy's going to come back and pick you off and just act like – like, he's got those balls of steel, the confidence. Like, I remember playing against guys like that. You know, I was at Memphis, and I would jump in sometimes for fun and play, like, scout team receiver and go out or, like, we're doing one-on-one drills and, like, murk somebody and get a catch, and I'm just dicking around messing with them. I'm like, God, you're trash if you let me beat you. And then, and then you know, they just – they start John or whatever – and it doesn't affect them. And then like two plays later, they'll guard someone else and make a good play. It just, their, their confidence never gets shattered. And I just like that about him. It's, it seems like his confidence never gets shattered. He plays feisty, he plays physical. He's always got a nose for the ball. 
And that play where he made the interception, it was a big-time play in a big-time spot. He had just got the P.I. The guy is doing a cross-country route or, or a post, trying to get over. He gets a little handsy, doesn't get caught, and then he plays the ball better than the receiver. So he's someone that I am excited about. And safety-wise, if I guess Trey's coming back, I think he said. I don't know about Tank. We'll see if those guys are the starters next year because they're going to be, you know, super eight-year senior type guys. But, like, my dude to Mary McDonald or, like, another safety like Tristan Charles, like, those guys that I like, like, I want to see if those guys take these guys' spot because we need some playmakers back there that's, good, you know, like, big-time interceptions, big-time hits, just be more of a presence besides of just, oh, okay, well, whatever. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I – I... We don't necessarily have the uh, the Eric Berries, the Jansen Jacksons, the you know Jonathan those Hefties. kind of safeties back there. Yeah, Gabriel Wilson, Rashad Baker. Yeah, yeah. There's there's we got it. We're working our way back, but in no way would I say that those guys are bad players. But like you said, no. they're just no. they're okay. They're good. We'll say it like that. Um, the other two things I want to talk about was. Pass rush lanes. I feel I, I love Rodney Garner and the coach that he is. I think he's done a great job in coaching up this defensive line. But there's a lot of times where I see these guys out of their lanes. And for people watching at home or listening at home that don't under, really understand what I'm talking about, you have an aiming point on the quarterback as a defensive lineman. The two defensive ends are headed for the backfield shoulder. That's what they're headed for. If you go even further, you're going to get out of position. If you go up even more, say you're headed for his numbers or his upfield shoulder, he's going to get around you and you're going to lose contain. So you have to head for that back shoulder. Now, the two defensive linemen on the inside are headed for his inside numbers. Okay. So that way, when you stay in your lanes and stay in that spot, he isn't going to have anywhere to go. He's not going to be able to squeeze through you guys. What's happened a lot and what I see, and it, it probably wasn't as bad because he's not a running quarterback in O'Connell, but it was just multiple times where it, a, a defensive lineman's lined up as a three technique and the guard, all he does is just keep pushing him out and he's trying to swim over the guards, the three technique, and he just keeps pushing him out. And there's this huge just gap between him and the other defensive tackle. And that is an issue. Like, you cannot have that much space for the quarterback to step up, for him to move around in the pocket. Like, you have to almost stay closer to each other and understand each other's bumpers. That way the quarterback doesn't have anywhere to go. Like, it does feel like everything's coming in on him and he doesn't have a chance to step up and throw. Because when quarterbacks step up and throw, it's a more confident throw. He has more power behind it. He can accurately throw it. If he doesn't have that ability to step up, then that really affects his accuracy, his strength in the throw, everything. So I feel like that is not enough of a coaching point from Rodney Garner, where it's like, where are you guys going? Why are you so outside of lanes? And even when you're running games, even when you're running twists between D tackles, you're supposed to get to the other person's lane. Like you're not supposed to just move out of the way and go where you think is the least resistance to the quarterback. Like, you got to stay near a lane and, and kind of almost contain that quarterback and make his pocket smaller instead of just one guy getting loose and everyone else is spread out. So I just, I, it just very much like irked me when I saw that because as an offensive lineman, I'm like, as a guard, I'm like, yeah, do that, bud. Like keep running to the outside and chasing around the edge. Like all you're doing is taking yourself out of the play. Like, especially if I'm a guard that, like, doesn't have center help, like center's going sliding the other way, and this guy just stays on my outside shoulder and just keeps working that way, I would love that. I'm just going to turn it into a run block and make this huge hole for the quarterback to do it every once, especially when we had Dobbs. Like, hey, Dobbs, just run. Like, these guys literally pretty much just gave you, like, a perfect draw opportunity. So that, and then we kind of already talked about it, but the two fourth quarter drives – in which Purdue scored to go 38 and to go 45. Those drives felt so aggravating because it had nothing to do with the skill level of Purdue, had nothing to do with how good their offensive coordinator was, 
how good their quarterbacks or wide receivers were. The first drive goes P.I., P.I., three-yard completion, incompletion, and then that missed tackle touchdown where Aaron Beasley spins around the tight end and just lets him go. In what way were any of those plays because Purdue is so good? It wasn't that. It was all because of us and things that we did. The next drive, four-yard four yard run to start, incomplete pass, and then Burrell falls down in man coverage on that wide receiver. What about that drive? Has anything to do with the greatness of Purdue? It's not. It's all our failings. It's all our guys falling or our guys having a penalty or our guys missing a tackle. It has nothing to do with the greatness of Purdue. So that's what irks me even more. Like if Buddy mossed Warren Burrell, just like absolutely like ripped it from his hands over his head and then pushed him to the ground and ran for a touchdown, that makes me feel a little bit different. But the fact that he just falls over, the fact that Aaron Beasley just lets the tight end go had nothing to do with the guy, you know, making a gronk type play and pushing dude in the dirt and stiff arming him, trucking somebody. Like that kind of stuff just drives you crazy as a fan and also as a coach. Like as a coach, you're like, buddy, I don't know what else you want me to do for you. I can't play the position. All I can do is put you in position to make the play and you shit down your leg. So those things annoy the crap out of me. And I really hate that it's, it's happening. I, I mean, I want to be positive and think like, Oh, these things will get corrected, but like it's been a whole season and this is happening in the bowl game. Like I'm going to need this to really not be an issue moving forward. Like I really do hope these coaches show them this game film. Because I, sometimes coaches won't do that. It's the last thing. I'm not going to ask you to come back in and watch film. Or or hopefully these guys watch it on their own. They just have pride in their work. And they're like, hey, I want to try and get better and see what I did wrong. But, like, that kind of stuff, it, it, it's just – you you got to see that it's, it has nothing to do with the other team. Like, it is all your own mistakes that are causing you to lose ball games. So, I'm going to jump in on a bunch of this stuff. First off, I thought O'Connell did a really nice job stepping up in the pocket. We, we gave him the lanes. I thought he did a fabulous job. I think earlier in the game on a couple of their deep completions, like one was a weight, like 30 yard deep dig deep in they completed and Beasley and, and, and Matthew Butler were so close to getting him, but he stepped up in the pocket. And there was just a bunch of times I thought he did a really nice job, you know, where we're close, we're, we're collapsing the pocket except in the front. And so he steps up, makes a nice throw. And so I want to give him credit that that was to give him credit. And another thing is too, like produce a, like, I felt like watching Purdue was like watching Tennessee with Jeff, with, with, uh, with coach Brom on the sideline. Like you and I jokingly talked about it. Like I wanted Brom when we were going through some of the different hires. And I definitely think he would have been much better than, than Pruitt at that time. Because I do feel like Brom in his own right is a little bit like a hypo, like where you kind of have an advantage with him on the sideline. I think he's a very good, uh, offensive minded. I feel like when I watch them, it's like, you know, they're going to have a play where they run it and it's, you know, three yard game and it's second and seven. And then they try to screen route and someone makes a good tackle and it's a two yard loss. So now you're back looking at, you know, like third and 10, third and nine, third and whatever. And then he just dials you up for 15 and it looks so easy like that. So I feel like watching Purdue was a lot like watching us on offense. And like I said, I do think that they were a a pretty good team. And I liked how offensively um, they passed and then opened up the run and they ran it more than I thought. And I thought they ran it better than I expected. And a lot of the times when I watched when we ran and I could watch back and go back on film, it was a lot of times where we got just our two – it's like our two big boys. So maybe it's Matthew Butler on the inside and uh, Omari Thomas, or maybe it's Omari Thomas and they play Caleb a lot on the inside who had a hell of a sack by the way. And then, or maybe it's uh, DeJon Terry and Matthew Butler on the inside. Okay. So those are all of our big boys on the inside, but then on the outside, you got uh, Byron Young, you got Tyler Bear or like Roman Harrison, which those guys size wise aren't that big. And so what Purdue was doing is they were doubling both of the big boys. So that's extremely difficult. So they're doubling both the big boys. 
and getting up to our linebackers. They're basically saying Roman Harrison, Tyler Barron, Byron Young, whoever else on the outside, you're not going to make the play on the inside. I'm talking about when we're running, when they're running a gap, B gap, whatever. And so I thought it was really smart. They're like, we're going to double. We're going to push you back a couple yards. And then we're going to extend up to your small linebackers of Beasley and Banks. And so I just thought they were super effective running the ball. So I'm thinking, okay, why don't we put another bigger guy in there to make, you know, three bigger guys, you know, maybe Jay, maybe bring a Jay Blakely in and have three bigger guys and only one of our lighter in the pants type guys. And I was thinking, I was like, well, maybe the defensive strategy is like, Hey, they're going to move the ball on us, but we want to tighten up in the red zone. Now, I don't know if that's what they did or not. Um, I always hate watching my team get gashed. I would have liked to ask Banks why we were letting them kind of just double and work their way up with with that bigger white running back that they had, and he was just pounding it. But I say all that to say we still did a pretty good job as, as a defensive team. You can look at the yardage. You can look at the penalties. You can look at all that stuff. This game, in my opinion – should not have really been close if it hadn't been for the offense stalling out and having a bunch of miscues, in my opinion. Now, could the defense have stepped up and made some more plays? Yes. But I think even when it started to get down to the nitty-gritty, the defense still made plays. That Byron Young interception was a hell of an interception. That His hands to make that – I mean, he, I was about to tweet out, but I was too busy watching the game. He's got better hands than Dadgum Princeton Fant or some of our other receivers or some of our other DBs. I mean, that was just a hell of an athletic play. And then, like I said, Trey Flowers makes a pick. And, and I take those are on back those to, are on back to back drives too. Correct, correct. And then, like I know Banks had a lot of tackles, and I thought he had a huge sack. That was a massive sack he had early in the game, red zone after Rucker got Moss. And um, you know, Tyler Barron had a good play on that on that goal line stand. And I thought Beasley shot up and had a real nice open field tackle earlier in the game on a like an out route or swing route. And so there were plays to be made. Um, I just think defense is really tough in this college football. It, and we're going to have to get more dogs on the defensive line in the corners to really lock people up and get pressure. But I thought the defense played well enough to win this game. And I think they played well enough to put this game away early. And I don't think the offense did it. So I, I'm sorry that I don't have I, – I mean, I got, you know, notes and stuff written down here on some plays that I was really happy with with some particular players – but I think this, instead of breaking down actual uh, plays, I think we're just talking more as a whole. And to finish up for the defense, for me, I, I thought they played well enough to win the game, even with how many yards they gave up, even with how many deep balls. I mean, a lot of a lot of Purdue Purdue had hell. They probably had four, four, five, six, seven real big chunk plays, and then they probably had twelve to fifteen other chunk plays of you know, 12 to 18 yards. I yeah. mean, they had a lot of big plays, so. I, I, I mean, I definitely agree that the defense played well enough to win this game. I mean, you had three turnovers. You forced three turnovers. You almost had two other interceptions that were dropped. So, I. Well, well let me say this. My biggest thing, like I was saying, is when that game is 21 to 7, and this will tie, this will jump me into offense. When that game is 21 to 7, we don't score another point and we let them go. We let them go field goal, so now it's 21-10. We let them go field goal again, 21-13. Then they go field goal again. We held them three field goals, and that was after they were on the one-yard line. Like, bro, that's so impressive in this college football. Like, they bowed their necks on the one-yard line and in the goal, and in the red zone area. Like, if our offense – don't give me a score every time, but just say on those three where they had three field goals, if you score two touchdowns, or two touchdowns in a field goal, whatever the case may be, that game could have easily been done. 20, 28 to 7, 31 to 10, you know, 35 to 10. And it, it's just done at that point. They're 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 not good enough to come. They're good enough to come back, but I think we're good enough to continue scoring as well. Yes. So, I agree. So, well, we've always had we've had an issue all year in the second quarter. It, it, I mean, it's happened all year long where I'm not sure what's going, like what happens in the second quarter, just defense like catches up to us. Um, but in this quarter, it was all penalties, man. It was penalties. It's false starts, legal formation, holding, all that kind of stuff, just just putting us behind the chains and ruining the drives. 
did what did we end with? 16 penalties? 15, 16? Yeah, I thought it was 14. Okay, well, it's one of this. Okay, it was a lot. I thought I saw it where it was like 15 for him for like one uh, he over 100 yards easy. Yeah, oh, it was way over 100 yards. It was like 154 or something. Like we had 14 okay. for 128. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, you know, four four of them were pass interferences that are just automatic, like 15 yards. So they added up quick. Right. Um, right. But yeah, I think I think the penalties is what killed those second quarter drives, and it's just like you have to take advantage of what the defense has given you. Like the fact that they were stopping them for field goals, the fact that they were getting turnovers, like as an offense, you have to take advantage of that. You can't just be like, Oh, well, we punted. Sorry. Like you didn't do anything for us. That interception did nothing. We punted both times. Like, Oh, well, like that's, that's what gets you beat. And you know, thinking about it, like watching Hendon play and like in no way did he play bad. I mean, he took care of the football mostly you know he had the one fumble uh well two fumbles one lost uh but the first one was a snap error that wasn't on him and I, I just i'm on the fence of like his deep ball completions because like obviously that is the like if you're going to rate everything in his game that's the worst part of his game i'll, I'll just jump in i'll just jump in right now i didn't th- i i thought him did i i texted buddies and I said, not that I don't dislike Kendon, not that I don't think he's a pretty good player. I said, if this coaching staff gets a guy who is more consistent through the air, watch the F out. Because it's not every game. It's not every few drives or few possessions. It's almost every other play or every possession. They have guys wide open. And I'm saying, and I'm saying wide open and then other ones that are open, like, Velas Jones, when he's got a guy two steps behind him, that's open. Then you got other guys where there's four steps behind him, that's wide open. And I just thought, and so I texted my group that I said, guys, when we get a guy who's more accurate, more consistent, literally watch out. And they're like, and one of them texted me back and said, Hendon's um, going to have like a Heisman campaign next year. Okay, fair. And then they also, te- another one texted me his stats. I said, those stats are good. And he might have a Heisman campaign next year. I'm just seeing what he's missing, like what else he could be instead of 11 for 18 for this many yards and a couple touchdowns, Duke should have had four tutties in the first half. Like I, I get it. Like you heard me say, I'm not going to beat up on people because you're going to win some, you're going to lose some like Rucker. Hey, he was in position. He got Moss. I'm not asking him to hit all of them. I'm just asking you to hit, you know, can you hit 60% of them? Can you hit 50% of them? Like, yeah. you know, and so I got really frustrated with him and I get it. The offensive line's not not been good for him all year. And I love the way he competes. I love the type of kid he is. And I I wouldn't ask for any other leader of our program. But like, we're here to win games. And like, if he keeps missing guys deep, or he keeps you know overthrowing guys on little fifteen yard outs, it's like you can't win that way. And so I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, you're good. I, I'm just gonna, I'm going to say this my offensively, and then you can finish. And I want to hear what you, I felt like there was a lot of offensive linemen playing. And I don't know if that was because of performance, injury, or – but there were some numbers out there that, like, I, I don't know who they were. Like, I didn't notice them. I and mean, I didn't go back enough, well enough, because I was watching more defense of, like – I like they said Kingston Harris was in the game. There was, like, another guy. I think the Lampley kid played some. Like, I don't know who the hell was in there. But, you know, I know they haven't been great. But Hendon still had time to hit plays. And my other – so my thing is my, – my three things about offense. You know, the offensive line is what it is, but my three things are Hendon's got to be more consistent, um, especially with the deep shots when you have a guy open. The second thing is we got to get some of these receivers in, in making catches. Like, Princeton Fant dropped like three or four balls. I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, hey, it's all cool and great to put out on Twitter. Like, I'm coming back. Let's run it back. Let's do it again. Love y'all. Do this, all this. Like, okay, great. That's awesome. Well, can you make some plays while you're at it? And I know he ended up making – one really nice catch towards the end of the game, and he broke off and run it. And I do think Princeton's a good player, and I do think he's a good runner. I mean, uh, excuse me, a good blocker in the run game. But, like, you can't be dropping third nines when your quarterback's stressing you to make that. Like, it's it's too critical. So, I need some more – I need I need better uh, complete – or better accuracy and consistently. I need some more catches. And the other thing that I – surprisingly with Hyde will kind of frustrated me, I felt like 
a lot this year. We have not been great on third and easy third and manageable. As an offense, all you want to do is truly get first downs and put your team in positions on third down. To, to You want third and easy, third and manageable, as they call it. And we're in third and manageable all the time. And we're and I snap I snapped the picture on the phone. It's third and two in the second quarter. And we literally run play action. Prince DeFant goes out there and turns around just like a little decoy. And we run two goes on the right side and we throw it deep. Our only two options are two shots on third and two. Like what what like what are we doing? Like we can't just try to get the two yards. We can't try to have multiple options. Like I'm fine if you pass it, have multiple options. Like I want to flip the field. And we just we chuck it deep twice, and on those they weren't open, and we didn't complete it. And then obviously, you know, we've had multiple like fourth and ones, fourth and twos this year where people stopped us because I've noticed whether it was Pitt way early on, whether it was Bama or Georgia or whoever else, they just send the house on the side of the running back. They send two guys because they know he's going to read one, and the guy's coming, so he has to give it. But then there's another one there chasing as well. So they know if we're going to run the read option or the inside, they're just sending two guys off the edge of where the running back is. So it's like, for me, can we come up with some different, like if you're going to do that, do a little play action pop pass, a little play action out. You know, I'm fine with running it some on those short downs. Another thing is, too, when we get down there and we're on the goal line, I was just about to text my buddies, like, can we just sneak this? Can we please just sneak it? Like, I love teams that just don't overthink stuff. Like, the greatest coach of all time in the NFL, Bill Belichick. He had Tom Brady. They would just sneak it. Just sneak it. Like, don't overthink it. Mike Mike Vrabel and the Titans do it a lot now. And it's like, we got Ryan Tannehill. We're just going to sneak it. Don't. There's times where the Titans have the best running back in the game, Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry's still six yards deep. And if some, if some quick guy's coming off the edge and gets into his feet or somebody beats his block, it's still hard for him to maybe get a fourth and one because he's starting at six yards deep. Just sneak it. With the best running back in the game, I'm saying still sneak it with Ryan Tannehill. And like I said, so like – and then I, as I'm about to go text my guys that, I look up, and we are under center. And I'm like, oh, my God, they're under center? Okay, great. Like, sneak it. What do they do? They go under center and turn around and hand it off. I'm like, oh, my gosh, just sneak it with Hinton Hooker. It's not that hard. And yeah. so, like, when you have a leaky offensive line, people can get beat and people can shoot gaps. So, I I'm think, done with offense. I'm, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So, you did whatever you Okay. Do. I got a lot. I got a lot of other stuff to – talk about what you're talking about. So what I was saying about Hendon, I was like kind of on the fence because if there is a part of a quarterback's game where you're like, this is the part he needs to work on the worst part of his game. It's deep balls. It's like, okay, then I, I'm going to be okay with that because deep balls are the hardest thing for a quarterback. Like no matter what quarterback you're talking about, they're the, you know, when you look at, the percentages of completions, deep balls are the lowest for every quarterback in the, in the world. They're the lowest. So for that to be his worst thing, like it's not interceptions or getting like not getting rid of the ball or his completion percentage or, you know, short or intermediate routes or reading a defensive end on, you know, uh, option or, or something like that. It's not that it's just the deep ball, which I I'm just like, okay, we can, we can fix that. Reed, go ahead. I raised my hand for you people not watching on YouTube. I raised my hand because I didn't interrupt. And I'm fine with that, Kyler. But you're saying it's the most difficult throw to make. It shouldn't be the most difficult throw to make when you guys got when you guys when you have guys wide ass open. I agree. And and like I said, just give me 50%. If you took me out to the field, bro, I'm gonna hit at least 50%. Every college quarterback is a thousand times better than me. They should be able to at least hit 50%. If you have one guy and you overthrow him, okay. When you come back, he should hit him. We had overthrows like – we'd probably have three or four or five overthrows in a row. So, like, I'm not asking for perfection. Just give me 50%. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I am with you on that. All I was saying is silver lining of it is if there is a place to struggle, that's going to be the place to struggle. Like, it's not like – a Garantano where it's like, this guy can't even hold onto the ball for us, you know? So definitely in a better place than, than not. Um, what you were saying about the, the third and shorts, we, we ran the same run out of the same formation four times on third and one, four separate times. We ran the same exact run out of the same exact formation and got stopped 
every time. I think no, we got we got the first down one time. We were stopped three out of four. And watching that, I'm like, what? First off, it's a bunch. It's a bunch to the the field side of wide receivers. So you got three wide receivers on that side. It is an inside zone away from them. So they have backside blocking. They're supposed to cut off the backside and it's just inside zone right off the center's butt. Why are you bringing them down there? All you're doing is stacking the box. That is all you're doing. If you are running the ball and it looks like you're running the ball and all, and you just bring wide receivers in just to stack the box, it's dumb. It gives you no options. And like you said, bringing guys off the edge like they did, two guys on that running back side, it takes away the read option for Hooker. It makes it to where he has to hand it off. But that's why you put Princeton fan over there, Jacob Warren, and you have him run just a little seam because it's going to be wide open. We did that all the time with Dobbs. We made it to where he had three or four options on every play. We'd have a tight end run in a seam. He could hand the ball off. He could take it himself. Or there was a bubble out in the edge. So it was like he had he made the decision of the offense. It wasn't just decided for him. It wasn't decided for him by the defense or it wasn't decided for him by the coaching staff where it's like, hey, the only option you have is to run it or pull it and it's like give it to Javari or pull it like that. I just don't think that's like a very good play when there's only two options for to get a first down. Like unless you are planning on going for it on fourth down, that's not what you should be calling. Um, and then I believe – and I agree with your sentiment about, you know, doing a QB sneak, but I believe wholeheartedly that if, if Jawari Small is in the game at running back on that last play, there isn't a question whether he scores. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like there was a question whether uh, Wright scored, like Jalen Wright. It's like, did he score? Did he not score? I think if Jabari's in there, it's he scored. There's no question. He's in the end zone. He's laying in the end zone. The way he runs and the way – like Jalen runs so upright. He has no forward lean, and it really just takes him out of plays. Like there are multiple times where I was just like, bro, as soon as someone touches you, your momentum has stopped. You can't get through any arm tackle. You can't get through any gap. I mean, there were plays where Jabari is looking over at the sideline like, hey, get me out of here. I'm worn out. I'm so tired. Like, you got to get me out of here. And then he'll bust one for 20. He just asked to be out. That's how tired he is. And he still busts one for 20, squeezing through two blocks, like finding a crack in the whole thing. When Jalen goes up there, it doesn't even look like he knows what he's doing. He, he's like pitter-pattering around the line of scrimmage, like not sure of himself. And obviously that's a r- young running back. But – if that is, it's another thing where it's like, know your weakness, know your strength. If that's the guy that's in on my last play, on my fourth and one, while I'm trying to score a touchdown, and he's been shaky all game, I'm not giving him the ball. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to put Hendon in a pistol and run a quarterback counter. I would much rather do that than give it to Jalen Wright. Like the way he was running on Thursday was just not like, it wasn't good. And, and so I, I wholeheartedly believe like if Jabari hadn't got hurt in that last few plays and was able to be our running back on that fourth and one, I don't think there's any doubt that we score. Like, I think it's an easy score for him because I think he understands how to read a defense and he's going to go, he's going to be leaning up on his toes going forward. There's no standing straight up, like shoulders high. Like that's how Jalen runs. And that's just like, you can't do that. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I don't think size ultimately matters that that much uh, at running back. I mean, I think if AK's in the game, he's going to score for us because his balance, his vision, his toughness, his strength, weirdly, is really good. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say like I, think, I wasn't saying size. That's not what no, I'm hold saying. On. No, I'm, no, 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 no. I'm not saying you are. I'm. I'm about to get to this. I, I, you know, I like how Jabari runs and I know I had a, I got a buddy that loves Tyon Evans. Like, I'm like, dude, forget Tyon Evans. Like he's gone. Like who cares? Like, I think he was fine, but he wasn't like amazing. Like, you know, he wasn't like an AK to us. You know, I think they feel like if he had still played, he brought a more power dynamic, you know, dimension to us. 
And so I'm not saying it has to be someone big. Like, I'm not saying, like, we got to bring a Jalen Hurd back or we got to have, you know, the Derrick Henrys, the Eddie Lacys, the um, just these big bruising running backs. I mean, hell, even the Purdue guy who was 6'3", 240, like, I'm not saying we have to have that. But, like, it will be nice to see a guy back there who's 5'10", 5'11", 208. You know, like, I even remember the guy for Ole Miss who looks like a freaking fire plug, like, big arms, big legs, and, you know, he's 200 and, you know, probably 8, 9, 10 pounds. He's not 240. But, like, I am going to be excited to see a running back like that in orange because you do feel better when they are back there. I'm not saying that guy scores every time. I'm just saying it does make me feel a little bit better on some of these short yardage, um, you know, I just feel like there's so many options at short yardage. If you do hand it off, it's nice to have a bigger body. You know, I, I hate the days of when I was growing up and we used to just jump over the pile. It was the easiest touchdown. Like, no football team does it ever anymore, and I don't know what happened. Like, it just got left in the early 90s or late 90s, early 2000s. But, like, hand it off, let him jump the pile. Like, it's a touchdown every time. Like, just quarterback sneak it. You know, so I just feel like there's so many options. But, um yeah, I, you know, it, like, I was making a comment on the way he was running and not. No, I, know, even, I know. No, I know. I know. Yeah, because I feel like Jabari, the way he was running has nothing to do with how big he was. Yeah. He's going to make that touchdown because, like, with Jalen running upright, he got hit that one time and it just completely stopped his momentum. Yeah. Like, it just completely stopped him. And he was like, uh, I guess I got to keep going forward. And then he gets wrapped up. And then it's like, you're not moving. Like, it slowed down and then he stretched. So that's what gave the view of the ref to be like, oh, it stopped. Now, I don't think it stopped. But like with Jabari, that guy would have hit him and he probably would have spun or he probably would have felt it but kept moving forward. Like, I just don't think it would have been the same kind of play. Um, I give uh, I give, I give, give Jalen credit. He kept fighting. He kept trying, doing his best. I agree with you that if Jabari's in there, it's probably a better chance because Jabari is the number one running back, so he's a better player. But I wasn't coming back at you saying size. I'm just saying since we're talking about that play, for me, yeah. one thing that people talk about is a size at running back. So, But anyways, continue with on with your offense yeah. stuff. Um, and, I mean, really the last thing I was going to talk about was the kick before end of regulation. A 56-yard kick. And this guy, the kicker is not a freshman. He's a transfer from USC. He's played a lot of games and he's never made a 56 yard kick. He's never made it. His, his longest was like five, six yards up. And I, if I'm in that scenario and it's just to win the game, not even lose the game, right? I'm not going to kick it. I'm going to put my offense out there and just try a Hail Mary or try something different because I think it the same way of like, do I want the quarterback to throw a throw he's never completed before? No. Like, do I want the running back to run a, a run that he's never had success with? No. I don't want my kicker to kick a ball that he's never made that he's, it's just not on his resume. That's not what I'm like. This is going to win me the game. So I just feel we should have just gone for it in that moment. Now that doesn't mean we score. That doesn't mean we don't score, but I think it's better than just sending him out there to try this kick that he really doesn't have any chance of making. Like I don't even think he got it the distance, not to mention <laughs> down the middle. So I'm going to be honest with you. It was a hell of a lot better kick than I expected because I was texting people. I said, there's no way he makes this. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way he makes this. And a guy like Purdue, I mean, they talked about the kid from Purdue. That kid started at like Sanford down in Birmingham, and now he's kicking for Purdue. Like, I guess I guess scouting kickers is tough. I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm blown away that for the longest time Alabama couldn't find a kicker. I'm blown away when a school like UT can't have a good kicker. Um, that kicker has been okay this year. Like all his balls look like weird knuckle balls and they, they always sketch me out. But like my biggest thing was how do we not with our offense, how do we not get closer 
with three timeouts and what was it? like we had 50 seconds was it or yeah 50, yeah it's like how are we not closer you know it really brought me back and i don't mean to bring up bad memories it really brought me back to your senior year at florida like when 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 the defense gives up the fourth and 13 they score we still had the ball with like three timeouts and 50 seconds and we had to give medley a chance for like a 55 56 yarder and so it was like how do we not with our offense then and our offense now, like get in better position? Like when they scored, I'm like, Oh, three timeouts. Oh, cookies. We're either about to score a touchdown or we're going to have a chip shot field goal. So I agree with you. Like I knew you weren't going to make it. So, you know, throw up, throw up a, an out, you know, I don't know, try to get closer. You still had what 11 seconds when we sent him out there. So it's like, try to get closer, you know, try to, you know, whatever. But I, I was not pumped about that, the, that ending sequence with, with the three timeouts and, not getting not getting in, in position so yeah uh, I, I I didn't think that went well I think there were definitely decisions made by Hypel that I don't necessarily agree with I wouldn't necessarily make those same decisions but you know you live and you learn I guess I think uh, I think I th- it's almost like when a team loses early in the season and it sets them up, to have success later because they felt that they got that one out of the way. And it's like, okay, now we got that one out of the way. Now let's lock the hell in and keep moving forward. Where like a lot of teams, if you lose towards the end of the season, like it's just over, like you don't have a chance to make it to the playoff or whatever. This almost feels like that, that we got this, this loss out of the way to really set us up for success in the future. Like it almost is, it's the rocket fuel that is going to propel us into this off season and into next season and being a possible favorite in the East. You know what else really helps us? Well, we're not going to be a favorite in the East when Ed George is coming back from them. They're coming out of the national championship. We're not going to be the favorite in the East, but I know what you mean. I'll say this, what also really helps and I'm done after this. It really helps that we're going to have so many old guys, so many older seniors, a lot of the times you lose a game like this and you're going to lose a bunch of seniors and you kind of have to start over with your leaders, bro. We know who our leaders are coming in next year. Like, so it's like, that's an extra thing. Like, all right, we didn't go out the way we wanted instead of Andy hooker having to get ready for the draft. Like, no, he can come back and he can say F that, like, I don't want it in that way. Let's, let's try to make a run at, at, at Atlanta, you know, let's see what happens. So anyway, I mean, great I mean, this team that we just saw is, pretty much who we're going to have next year. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, Valus is like one of the only ones that it's like he played instead of just. Well, except, except defensively. I mean, losing defensively, Matthew Butler. Oh, I love that man. I uh, I hope the best for him. He, I, I had all my notes. He absolutely whipped a couple guys shooting in the backfield, making tackles and then losing Theo. I think Theo's going to be easier to replace, but you know, we, we need some, some of those defensive tackles stand up, but Hey, great pod. And our next one will be, we're going to do, I guess, our full season recap, which will probably be a very long, a lot of, a lot of research going into that one. Sure. Before we leave, who, who do you got? Georgia or Bama? Bama. Saban. I think it's Saban. Curry's going to fall apart again. I can't believe that Saban's catching three. Yeah, I know. It's honestly insane. Um, I hope I honestly, and we talked about this before, I don't have this animosity towards Georgia like other people do. So I would like if Georgia won. And I know you don't like that because you want to hold the national championship over their heads. And I'm sure a lot of ball faithful want to do the same. But um, I appreciate you guys coming out. Appreciate you watching and listening on all your platforms on YouTube. Make sure to hit subscribe and make sure to like it. A lot of you guys are watching, but you're not liking. And a lot of you guys are watching, you're not subscribing. So go ahead and do that. Turn on notification bell and you'll be notified whenever the video pops up. Um, Like and review for all those people listening. Uh, Let us know how we're doing. Uh, You can contact us, uh, 865-322-9232 is a phone number, text, or voicemails. Um, And you can email us, uh, believeintennesseefootball at gmail.com. Uh, And then social media, we love interacting with you guys. We love it when you ask us questions and reach out. So I'm at Kyler Kerbison on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It is at rbacon26 on Twitter for Reed and at Believe in Tennessee on Twitter for our main account. So please check those things out. Um, 
as always, we're presented by betonline.ag. So if you're betting on any game, go ahead and head over there uh, for everything you need, especially this national championship coming up. Uh, and as always, go balls.